Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Guy Aitchison's Reinventing the Tattoo Community, where tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious are encouraged to join in live streams, real world events, to share and inspire and ultimately create better art and tattoos together. We beam out nearly every day and with your help have evolved into a quality network of amazing live and on-demand tattoo and art shows that have all been receiving rave reviews. You're currently watching the Sunday Afternoon Drawing Group with me, Jason Leeser. Um, artists, feel free to zoom in by clicking on the link in the events area or in the course schedule. Uh, if anyone would like to join in during this live stream, please send me a message either on uh, YouTube or in Facebook or somewhere along those lines. I'll be happy to send you the URL so that you can join us as well. You might be beaming in from YouTube or Facebook. Maybe you're listening to the podcast, but you can always get the latest event schedule and notifications at the official Reinventing the Tattoo community. Found at both app stores, the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, or directly at community.reinventingthetattoo.com. If this is working for you, please let me know in the chats um, and tag a friend who loves tattoos. Also, if you enjoy listening to this type of content, Please remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons really helps us get our name out there a little bit more and help drives things a little bit more to this so that we can continue to provide you with this type of quality program. All reinventing the tattoo network shows art jams drawing groups interviews panels webinars all of it can be enjoyed on demand and found in the library, as well as the YouTube and podcast channels. There are countless tattoo and art rabbit holes for you to jump into. It's great for the front room of your studio or to entertain your clients as they're getting tattooed. In fact, we're beaming out four channels, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can find that at reinventing247.com. We always have some weekly staple shows. We always encourage people to uh, tune into starting on Sundays at 1 PM with me, Jason Leeser. Um, and that is followed on Monday mornings at 9 a.m. by the Early Bird Drawing Group with Kier, where we go through and discuss all types of different things, uh, as well as, you know, art stuff and tattoo stuff and, you know, all any, any manner of different things you can imagine, from philosophy and well-being to art. Um, that's followed at 11 a.m. on Mondays with the Tattoo Weekly, hosted by Lauren Gregory, Gabe Ripley, and Jake Meeks of the Fireside Tattoo Network. Um, it's always a great way to go through and catch up on what's happening in the tattoo industry, you know, this past week. Uh, that is followed on Mondays at 9 p.m. with an, a subscriber exclusive with Guy Aitchison himself, um, only available for people that have a subscription to the Reinventing the Tattoo Canon where you get to jump into a live Zoom with Guy and work on artwork with him in real time. Um, I've been doing it for a little over a year now, and you can definitely see a result in what I've been able to achieve and where my artwork started and where it's at today. Um, highly recommend people jumping into those live sessions. They're absolutely awesome. Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Eastern time, there's another live drawing group with Ricardo Sertivant, very good friend of mine, an extremely talented fine artist, and one hell of a tattooer as well. Uh, we go through and we discuss all different types of things uh, that are philosophical and art related. Uh, he does some, you know, some art drawing groups and uh, art guides and walking people through different things dealing with fine art. Wednesdays at 12 noon, we have the Tattoo Now show with Gabe Ripley, uh, where we go through and talk a little bit more about the business side of the tattoo industry, uh, where, you know, we start talking about, you know, advertising and recruitment, um, you know, hourly rates, things like that. Thursdays at 10 a.m., we have another subscriber exclusive with Kier, uh, directly focused at fundamentals and basics. Uh, all skill levels are encouraged to attend, as we all know, every now and then, we have to go back through and revisit some of our fundamentals, uh, just so that we keep those fresh in our minds. Thursdays at 12 noon, we have the Tattoo Collecting Podcast with Fawn Baker and Jordan Ruckus. Uh, it's always great to hear different stories from different people around the world, 
uh, chiming in and discussing some of the adventures they've had along their tattoo journey. We've got a number of different real world events coming up as well, uh, such as February 5th through 6th, Reinventing the Tattoo will be live from the Red Tree Gallery and True Tubes headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. I'll be there. Um, I know a number of other artists are going to be there, including Bob Tyrell, who's going to be putting on a seminar. Nick Baxter's got a seminar. He'll be live streaming in on Sunday. That's going to be absolutely incredible. He's going to be discussing layering. Um, it's going to be really, really awesome. If you guys can't make it in person, maybe you don't live in the Columbus, Ohio area, that's fine. Tune in virtually. We're going to be live streaming out a lot of these different things. It's going to be an amazing time. April 11th through 14th, Inspiring Tours in New Hampshire uh, will be hosting a, a small group getaway with Sean Barber and Nick Baxter, um, two of the leading fine art tattooists in the world, in my personal opinion, where they will be going through and doing an oil painting workshop. Um, once again, very small groups. If you weren't able to get on this year's list, Go to http colon slash slash inspiring dot tours to get on the waiting list for next one. Uh, I would say next year, but I think they're actually doing one in fall. Could be wrong though. Uh, don't hold me to it. May 20th through 22nd, 2022, we have Hell City Columbus. Uh, as most of you know that are watching, Hell City is one of the premier tattoo conventions in this country. It's absolutely incredible and has an all-star lineup. We'll be there doing some, uh, some live broadcasting and some live convention coverage. June 3rd through 5th up in uh, Calgary, Canada, there is the new Deadly Tattoo Convention uh, organized by James Tex of Deadly Tattoos. Um, and that is looking like it is going to have one heck of an all-star illustrative lineup. Um, I mean, some of my favorite artists will be there, so I will be there doing live convention coverage. July 29th through 31st, there's the Rubber City Tattoo Invitational in Akron, Ohio with Tony Urbanek. Uh, most of you may know him from his awesome coil machines. Well, he took over the Rubber City Tattoo Invitational, and it's going to be epic. Um, October 20th through 23rd, I believe we are going to be back up and running with the official Paradise Tattoo Gathering. Uh, that's the last thing I've heard. I could be wrong, but that was the last memo I got, so I'm going to announce it. Would like to actually go through and um, give a quick shout out and thank you to some of the people that make this happen. Um, we'll start off with Interstate Inc. LA. Many of you may know Church from his awesome custom sneakers. His studio is actually seeking resident and guest artists. It's all clean and sober. If you are an artist in recovery, or if you're looking for a supporting studio, or maybe you know someone that needs one, reach out to them at Interstate Inc. LA on Instagram. Get in contact with them. It's a great group of guys, um, awesome people, and it's going to be an amazing environment. Next up, we have rawpigments.co. Uh, hold on one second. There we go. Let me just switch that. Rawpigments.co, an ink company that's tapping into the source. Um, I've started to utilize a lot of those. Love their color, Sapphire. Um, they also have another color called Chevelle. It's like one of the most beautiful reds I've ever used. Um, highly recommend them. I've started to incorporate a lot of them into my lineup. They are 100% acrylic free, heavy metal free and vegan friendly. It's trying to get back to like the basics of like that old school powder that we were all used to seeing and all used to using way back when. It's, it's starting to get back to that. You'll, you'll love it. I can guarantee it. It's got some of the most vivid colors you can imagine. Uh, next, we have worldtattooevents.com, the largest, most comprehensive resource for tattoo events worldwide. Um, they're constantly doing live updates to this site in order to keep everything up to date with everything being rescheduled and everything being postponed. Um, you never know what's going to be actually going on and what's not going on. Stuff's getting canceled last minute. 
So the best way to stay up to date with it, worldtattooevents.com. Uh, D-Lies Pro, also known as Dermalize Pro in the rest of the world, protect your art. If you're still using plastic wrap to wrap your tattoos, I think it's time to step your game up. Um, this stuff is specifically designed to heal tattoos. Take a look at it, D-Lies Pro. Uh, next, we have Tattoo Now, technology for tattooers. The leading edge in SEO and professional develop development for tattooers of all levels, and they're now accepting new clients. If you really want to start recruiting people that want to get the types of tattoos that you want to do, this is how you do it. They will help you get your name out there. They will help you attract the clients that you are looking for. You can't go wrong with Tattoo Now. And of course, the founder and inspiration behind reinventing the tattoo, Guy Aitchison. Um, you can find him at GuyHison.com and TattooEducation.com, where you can pick up a copy of his Biomech Encyclopedia. He's got a couple of, uh, I'm not sure how many are left. They are selling pretty quickly, but he's got some custom coil machines that he hand built. Those are for sale. He also has some original oil paintings, some DVDs, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. You can buy some limited edition prints. I mean, his stuff is absolutely incredible. Thank you, Guy, for everything. I wouldn't be on YouTube right now if it wasn't for you. So wanted to give you a big shout out and say thank you very much. Also, would like to take a minute to go through and thank our affiliates, the Fireside Tattoo Network, hosted by Jake Meeks, um, where they won't teach you how to tattoo, but if you already know how to tattoo, they will teach you how to tattoo better. So go through, take a look at that. I don't think I've missed an episode since started listening to him years ago. Um, absolutely incredible information over there. And The Apprenticeship Diaries, with, hosted by Amy Nichols, a very good friend of mine, absolutely incredible tattooer. If you are looking to get your foot in the door and learn how to tattoo the right way, th that's where you need to go for the information. They will discuss all different types of what makes a good apprenticeship, how to get an apprenticeship, um, you know, what to expect in it, you know, what are the good things and the bad things and, you know, how, you know, how can you go about really diving into this and learning in the best way possible. So take a look at that. That's the Apprenticeship Diaries with Amy Nichols. Um, so, Yeah. Please spread the word about our channel. Uh, we're trying to get some more new faces in here. If anyone is ever interested, please, by all means, shoot me a message, um, you know, send me a message either in the chats or the comments. And um, yeah, I'll be happy to send you the, uh, the URL to join us live here on the Zoom. So without further ado, I've got a pretty fun art project I'm going to be working on today, uh, working on a hammerhead shark. And I'm trying to get back to my roots. As um, some of you may know, one of my New Year's resolutions was to start working more analog. Um, not that I haven't already done plenty of analog stuff, but you know, it's, it's really to go through and really get back to those roots. So uh, I'm going to be working on that for a little while today. Please, by all means, feel free to uh, jump in, zoom in, uh, just write some cool comments. Um, you know, it's always a good time. We always try to encourage new people to join us. So please, by all means, feel free to jump in at any point in time. Um, I'll be trying to keep an eye on the comments as I'm working. And um, yeah, hopefully I uh, see you guys in here. And let me just switch my camera view and get one or two things together real quick. We'll start out with these guys. Uh, no. So for today, I'm going to be using uh, a couple of cool things. These are Pentel um, Aqua pens, Aqua wash pens uh they're like brush pens that you fill up the handle with water um and you can use those to blend out from whatever you're using got like a little nylon brush tip 
um, that stays constantly damp because as you can tell, you fill up the handle with water. Um, I love using these. I've done entire paintings with these and they come in a variety of sizes. You know, some are a little bit bigger than others. Um, you know, this one's a little bit bigger than the last one. And I'm also going to be using, uh, a, also by Pentel, this is a gray wash brush pen. Um, Pentel makes different types of uh, pigment liners, pigment brushes and stuff like that. And um, I fell in love with them years ago. And they actually have one that's a specific gray wash that's permanent. Um, and I love this thing. So I usually like to go through and do a whole bunch of, um, you know, like washy areas, you know, just basically breaking down my, my, uh, breaking down my, my values first blocking that in where I want my darks, where I want my lights, you know, so that that way, when I go to add color, you know, it's already basically blocked in. I love coffee. Uh, let's see, we've got Whitney. Hey, Whitney, how's it going? Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, depending on where you are, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, Gerardo, uh, ha good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to you as well, sir. Looks like we have uh, Gabe in the chats as well. Hey, Gabe, how's it going? Hope you're doing well today. Uh, let's see what else we got going on. I do try my best to um, to keep an eye on all of the chat messages. Sometimes it does get to be a little bit much. So if I do miss your comment, I apologize sincerely. Hopefully you guys can hear me coming through all right. Um, if you can't or if you can't see me or anything like that, let me know. I need to kind of know these things so that that way I know what to fix. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm going to be starting off with some gray, some gray washy stuff today um, on this hammerhead shark that I'm painting. And we'll switch that around. You can already see that I've got some of it penciled onto the paper and I've already started working on some of the gray wash. Um, I think I'm going to do some kind of wacky colors for this. So uh, it should be pretty interesting. Uh, I think I'm going to do the shark in like an olive drab green. And um, I'm thinking about doing all the background water in red. So just because it's different and I don't have any other reasons why. It's what I want to do. So this is a technique that I really, really like to use a lot. Um, I know you guys can't really tell, but the glass surface that I am working on is actually tilted at an incline of about 45 degrees. Uh, it's, or it's probably closer to 30 degrees, but I always prefer to work on a surface whenever I'm working with watercolor or aqueous media of any type. I always prefer to have it instead of being totally flat. I like to have it up at a little bit of an angle to allow gravity to work with the water so that if I get an area that's a little too wet, it's okay because I know what direction that water is going to move. It's not just going to sit and then spread around. It's actually going to move in a direction and it's going to soak into the paper in a direction. Um, I find it's always super helpful. So what I like to do first is I'll go through and I'll do like a little line of water and kind of spread that out. And then I'm going to go through with my gray wash brush. And you can see how like these little trails, I don't know how well you can see it, but these little trails, that's all because of the direction that the, um, it's all because of the tilt on the table. You know, because it having just that little bit of gravity really makes all of the difference in the world. Um, I have painted using watercolors and liquid acrylics and stuff like that on uh, flat surfaces before. I'm not a big fan of it. 
just because you can't really control the movement as well as if it was a tilted surface. That should dry to a very nice light gray. And we'll go over here. You'll probably notice that I haven't taped down my, uh, my paper at all or stabilized it in any way. And there's a reason why. And that's because I like to move my paper around as I'm working on it. Um, I like to be able to rotate it just so that I can get to whatever parts and still have that kind of a downward movement because of the gravity and the angle of the table that I'm working on. You know, so it doesn't matter if I'm doing this fin or this area, or maybe I want to go through and do a little bit over here and do like, you know, say my light is coming straight down from the top. I need, I now need to go through and adjust this and then do this part and have this fade down this way. Well, I can't do that unless I can move my paper around. Otherwise, everything's going to fall in the same direction. And that's not what I want. Uh, sure. Uh, Gerardo, uh, post up your, uh, your Instagram and I'll go through Instagram and I'll send you a DM with the link. That's if you still want to join. Sorry, I just saw that. The who else is in here today? Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm running a little bit behind. Yeah, Gerardo, um, if you want to post up a, an email or an Instagram profile or something like that, where I can send you the, um, or actually send me a DM if you want to on Instagram at Philly Inc. Uh, you'll notice that it's posted like, uh, let me see if I can, yeah, like right up here, you'll see that and I'll move this to the side so that you can see it a little bit better. Um, shoot me a uh, DM on Instagram if you want to, and I'll, I'll be happy to send you the link. I can't post it publicly though, because we've done that in the past and it just gets to be a mess. So where was I? Oh, I need some more water in this guy. Refill this. Where did I put my dropper? Oh, man, this is what happens. This all comes back to uh, preparation. Preparation is one of the things I'm biggest on and I hate it when I'm not prepared for certain things. Um, in business school, they have a, a little saying, there are seven Ps to success, right? 
proper preparation prevents poor performance. Um, and that's basically saying the more you prepare and the more work you do ahead of time, the better the outcome will be. You know, if you're going through and it doesn't matter if you're doing a tattoo, it doesn't matter if you're doing, you know, a YouTube video, it doesn't matter if you're working on a painting or an illustration or a digital design or making prints, if you prepare correctly, and if you take the time to put in enough preparation work, it's gonna be hard to not succeed. You know, and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of failure. Um, I enjoy failing because I learned something from it. So where was I? So you can already start to see some of that layer drying up, uh, which is pretty cool. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little bit distracted. But all right, so where was I? Cool, I don't know if this is still going strong or not, but. When you do tattoo, make money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the goal, right? Is to go through and make as much money as you can while you're doing tattoos. I'm not saying be greedy, but, you know, get your money's worth out of it. You know, you, we are practitioners of an ancient form of art. That does not come cheap. Granted, I see things very differently than a lot of people. Um, but, you know, I am a firm believer that, you know, not everyone out there can do successful tattoos. You know? And thus, those people that do successful tattoos that are really, really, truly awesome, yeah, they're worth every penny. So why wouldn't I want to pay whatever an artist tells me I need to pay to get a piece done by them? And if I can't afford it, it's like, okay, cool. I can't get it done right now, but I'm going to go home and save my money, and then I'm going to get it done. You know, it's like anything else in life. If it's something you really want, you'll find a way to make it happen. You know, and if it, it, well, it comes down to another very good, very strong philosophy I have in life, and that's we always make the time in our lives for the things that we want the most, right? If you want to go to the gym and you really want to get in shape or, you know, get more fit or get them gains, uh, you'll find the time to do it, right? That's just the way that the world works. Um, and it's the way that life works. And if it's something that we really don't want to do, we're not going to make the time for it. And we're not going to do it because it's not something that really piques our interest for whatever reason. You know, I wanted to get back to doing more analog art. So I'm making the time to do it, you know, and it's not always easy to make the time. There's always going to be sacrifice involved in some aspect, but that's just the nature of the beast. Nothing in life is free. There is no such thing as a free lunch. We can't just have something from nothing. We, there's always a price to be paid for whatever it is that we really, really want. Sometimes it's monetary. You know, sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's commitment. Sometimes there's a bigger sacrifice involved. You know, sometimes we don't even really know um, what we're going to end up having or needing to sacrifice, you know, but just know that we will have to sacrifice something. Uh, 
Now for these little guys, I might actually go in with a brush there. So I'm gonna put my gray wash away um, and grab. This stuff, by the way, is the best black you can ever use to paint with. And I don't know how well you can actually see it because it is kind of backlit. It's Dr. P.H. Martin's Black Star Matte. It's waterproof black India ink, and it is incredible. Um, that's what I use for all of my outlines. It's what I use for... Um, you know, everything, pretty much everything that I do, except for uh, gray wash. For gray wash, you can pick up a bottle of this. It's also by Dr. P.H. Martins. It's their ocean fountain pen ink. It is waterproof. Um, and it does thin out really, really well to give you these nice silvery gray tones. And I need a small brush. And this guy should do, where did you go? This one will do, no. this. You know, it's such a shame that they discontinued my favorite brushes. Um, My favorite brushes are these. They're uh, Royal and Langnickel Mini Majestics. Um, I have not been able to find them in ages. They are, this is a number four. And it's like my go-to multi-purpose Swiss Army knife of brushes. I've gotten so good at utilizing it for everything. It's ridiculous. And uh, as far as my setup goes, I'll show you what I got going on real quick. Um, so for a lot of my free poured inks and all of the stuff that I'm you know, pouring out by hand, I actually have a tattoo tray out. This is from uh, True Tubes. Um, and it comes with like all of these super tiny little ink caps and like a big mixing surface and three little rinse out areas and a place for cartridges in the back of it. It's pretty cool. I've used them and I used to use them for tattooing um, until I realized it was kind of like overkill a bit because I never really used that many colors. Um, so I didn't really bother to buy any more of them and now I just use them to paint. And they're kind of like big and awkward. Not that I have an issue with that, but you know, sometimes it's better to have something that's a little bit smaller. Um, as far as just generalized footprint goes, These guys will work. There we go. So once again, as far as like all of this gray wash is concerned, I'm going to go through and I know that I want my gray wash to move in this direction to kind of show this part as being a part of the shadow gill. So I'm going to go through and lay just a little bit of water down first. Then I'm going to take my uh, ocean black, right? And I just add a tiny little bit of it because that's all you, all you need. Then you can come back through, move that around in that damp area. 
and just kind of spread it out as I'm going through. And if I want to get a lighter gradient in value, I'll rinse it, dry it. And then you can't ever really get these completely dry. So I always like to just go through and dry it out or wipe it off as I'm going. And if you use a dry brush on top of an already wet area on paper, what it's going to do is suck all of that dampness towards it. It's going to act like a sponge and soak things up. So you're going to actually create a lighter wash and a lighter gradient just by using a dry brush in an already damp area. Now, some of you may wonder why I'm working with watercolors, why I'm working with like, you know, all of the um, like liquid acrylics and anything aqueous and translucent. It's because I find it's way more akin to actually tattooing than it is to um, anything else. Cool. Cool. And we may have uh, someone else joining us today. Um, so hopefully they jump in. You know, that's uh, something I love about being a member of this community. Most people that are out there are, are all about just helping each other out. Um, you know, other artists and stuff like that. Every now and then you get someone out there that's a bit of a prick, but, you know, not, you don't really see too many of those anymore um, because, you know, it used to be a super secret industry where it's like, no, 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 these are my secrets. No one can know them, you know? That's, that's what makes me a better tattooer than everyone else. And it's like, yeah, right, okay, sure. I'll just go and learn everything from someone else and I'll be better than you are pretty soon. Then I'll take a dry brush and just kind of soak that up. And it doesn't have to be perfect. That's part of the beauty of art. Art does not have to be perfect. Your tattoos are a different story. You know, tattoos are always a bit of a different story. Those you need to make sure that they are on point. And I mean, being an artist, we're always going to find issues with all of the work that we do. There's no doubt about that. I can find every flaw in everything I've ever done, you know, but I'm also constantly working to try to improve. Those people that can see the flaws in their work and don't do anything to change it, those are the ones I worry about. You know, I'm always actively looking for ways to better myself. But yeah, I always find that um, working with like watercolor and liquid acrylic is way, way closer to uh, working more as like an actual tattoo than anything else. You know, just simply because of the way that you can layer and you have to preserve your light areas if you're painting with watercolor and um, liquid acrylics. Because if you don't preserve those light areas that you want to keep super white, uh, there's no going back over top of it. I mean, you can with like acrylic paint, but that doesn't work in the tattoo industry. It's not like you're gonna get a super vibrant white unless you leave an area for it. You know, it'll be light, it'll be a lighter value if you go with white over a color or white over something else, but it's not gonna be as pure blatantly white, you know, as if you were to go through and actually leave a dedicated area just for it.
Yeah, I'm just building up these darker values for the gills. Some people will actually keep a hair dryer on hand just to help these areas dry quicker. Um, you can do that. I've done that in the past when I've been on, on a deadline. But um, it's not something I enjoy doing just because I like, I like to hear my music in the background and stuff like that. I don't know, I'm weird. So we're gonna move on to a different area while that area dries and I can go back through and I'll get that last little gill in there. And we'll take our gray wash. And give me a bigger, more broad tip on one of these water pens. So this is a big flat guy for doing large areas of wash. The only downside to working with free floating paper like I am is um, the fact that you will start to notice it warping after a while. And that's totally normal. It's not like, you know, it's gonna be detrimental or anything. Um, you will notice it starting to warp. You'll start to notice those little ripples appearing in the actual surface of the paper itself. And that's totally normal. One way that you can get around that is by going through and actually using um, a piece of like particle board or MDF or, you know, whatever, or plywood, if you have plywood or, you know, whatever kind of like stable, you know, easily manageable surface you can get your hands on. Um, I'd stay away from things like aluminum because that just gets really tricky. And then you have to deal with rivets and stuff. But one thing I've done in the past is I've even used canvas stretcher bars to stretch out watercolor paper. And what that does is it prevents anything from wrinkling and warping um, you know, and allows you to work in a little bit more of a fast pace, in my opinion. Um, it's pretty interesting to do it that way too, because you have to soak the paper, staple it to the stretcher bars. And then as you're, um, as you're going through and, you know, letting it dry before you start painting, you'll notice it like actually shrinking to the point that it can actually tear the paper. Um, you know, if you're using a lighter weight paper, say like a 90 pound, a 90 pound cold press or something like that, you know, something a little bit more on, on the lower and less expensive end, um, it, you'll actually start to see tears where those staples go in. And uh, that it can tear the edges of the paper as long as you staple it far enough in from the edge, it's not going to be too much of an issue. That should be pretty dry by now. I thought I had a small little guy. Oh, that's large. Where are my smaller water pens? Probably buried somewhere in my pile of brushes. Oh well. I think you can get that. That one's too big. That'll do. So now I'm going to go back through with these gills. I already did some dark. Now I'm just going to go through with the gray wash. And I'm just going to drag right along the edge. And just like in tattooing, you'll notice these values really lighten up as it dries. And I'm just going through and really helping to define the edge here by these gills. 
going right next to it with water. This is just another one of many different techniques to get a nice fade or a nice blend. Just have to make sure that you're pretty on point with it. Otherwise, it's going to dry. The paint that you're putting down is going to dry too quickly. And then you won't be able to blend it out at all. But if you can get to it before it's completely dry, you're gravy. Not like in tattooing, but in tattooing, which is a beast of a different nature, I will give you that. Um, it is a bit of a different technique, but you already know that. You guys are tattooers. This part's going to be a little tricky, but let's go through. I'm going to be going over all of this with like an olive drab green anyway, so I'm not really super concerned with, um, you know, where my values are. You know, this is basically just blocking in for me so that I can get a better idea of where I want certain values to be. And where do I want my light source to be? Because anywhere where this gray shines through, it's going to create a more dull, desaturated tone. You know, just like if you were to tattoo and you were to put down a layer of like light gray wash and then blast over it with a red, that's going to create a much more desaturated or dull tone red. And it, if you go over it with a dark red, it may actually end up being too dark of a value. You know, so just always kind of keep that in mind. Let's get some water first. One thing I used to do when I started out painting flash and stuff like that is I used to take a blob of yellow and dilute it a bit so that it was pretty light before I ever started painting. And I would just drop it right in the middle of the page. And the reason why is because after I did that, I stopped really caring if everything was perfect. And I just started to keep things more loose. And I stopped getting, I stopped worrying about, is this area 100% perfect? It didn't have to be 100% perfect because technically I had already ruined everything. You know, uh, by dropping that yellow in there, I knew it wasn't going to be perfect from the get-go, so I just wanted to have fun with it. And we'll do a little bit of lighter gray over here, right along this edge. By the way, I don't know if anyone out there that's watching saw it, but um, BJ Betts actually released his own brand of cartridges. If any of you out there have used them, let me know how they are. I'm considering picking up a couple of boxes of them. Um, and I'm sure they're, they're awesome because, you know, BJ Betts is the man and he's got his name on it. So they better be awesome. You know, he's got some pretty high standards. But uh, if you have used them, let me know what you think. I'm pretty used to Black Claw and Cheyenne. Um, and uh, um, I've also used a whole lot of the, the Good Guy Supply um, Supreme cartridges. Love those. Absolutely love those. They've got just the right amount of um, solder on them 
so that they're not too stiff and they're not too uh, too floppy. And they've got great ink flow. And that's something I'm like super critical about. Cool. We'll go through. I'm gonna hit this top fin real quick. And then uh, I'm going to break out some colors and I'm going to start coloring it in. Yeah, this um, this Pentel water brush setup is actually uh, this was my whole setup throughout college. Um, I used to take watercolor pencils or Derwent uh, ink tense pencils because those were permanent, just like tattoo ink. And I used to bring a water brush and some of those with me everywhere I went so that I could work on projects in between classes, say I had 20 minutes or 30 minutes in between classes. Instead of rushing over to the studio and getting everything set up and, you know, breaking out like a whole palette of colors and brushes and then doing cleanup afterwards. I used to just work with uh, more aqueous media like watercolors, liquid acrylics and stuff like that while I was in college. And um, it saved me a ton of time and really allowed me to work on some of the projects that I wanted to work on in the medium that I wanted to work on them in. You know, a lot of art schools and colleges force you to paint in oils and acrylics and stuff like that. I think most of them do acrylics now because oils are so toxic. Um, nothing beats oils though. I love oil, oil painting. I didn't for the longest time. I absolutely hated it. Then I picked up a few tips from Christian Perez and uh, it changed my entire perspective on oil painting. So, yeah. Cool, we'll let that dry. I think I wanna do just a hair more in this area. For the underbelly. So you guys can still see this all right. You know, one thing I do uh, find myself being drawn to this kind of a medium more so than anything else, though, is the fact that you have to plan it out in advance if you want it to be super crisp. There are a lot of people out there that have that use a very uh, loose kind of watercolor style, um, and that's pretty awesome. I like the more technical illustrations, though. That's just something I've always been drawn to you know, brush control and planning and perspective and all that stuff. Um, I really, really just find myself drawn to that kind of stuff. And um, so I always try to work with the aqueous media in that kind of a way. I'll go through and plan things out. And yeah, it takes a little bit of the, the spontaneity out of it. But you know, once again, that's something I'm more drawn to is a lot more of the technical stuff. Um, you know, seeing people like Steph Bastian who have like, who have brush control on a whole different level, you know, who can sit down and say, I want this to be here. And it's boom there and it's perfect every time. Who, by the way, if you don't follow Steph Bastian on Instagram, you probably should because he's got like a world of knowledge about tattooing in the industry and like, uh, you know, philosophy of, you know, being an artist and stuff like that. Uh, definitely an inspiring human being. 
I think he actually runs the Tattoo Tales podcast um, where he goes through and interviews different people. I'd love to get him on here one day and interview him. Um, I'm not sure what where he's living right now or what the time difference is, but um, definitely an inspiring human being. Yeah, if you're like me and you listen to a whole bunch of podcasts, take a look at Steph Bastian's Tattoo Tales. Um, definitely amazing. I'll, of course, the Fireside Tattoo Podcasts are awesome. Um, you know, I think Steph Bastian is taking it a bit further and looking at it at a bit more of a uh, philosophical perspective and really looking at what needs to be addressed in this industry as far as, you know, not just technical aspects, but like, what does it mean to be a tattoo artist in this day and age? You know, what do we really need to know in order to get better at everything that we're doing? Um, and not just in a, not just in a kind of pure philosophy kind of way, but definitely more of a, let me enlighten you to my experiences over the past 20 some odd years of tattooing kind of way. Um, he's an extremely talented, well-rounded fine artist. Um, he's, you know, capable of doing realism and portraiture, but in the past few years, he's really started to boil that down to the essence of what is there? You know, what, what shape is this? How can I extract the essence of, say, a hammerhead without actually drawing or painting a realistic hammerhead? How, but how can I get it across in a different way? You know, and that brings up a whole bunch of different challenges. You know, we're all artists. We all function on a different level and in a different way from every other artist out there. We all have different techniques, tips, and tricks that we use. I always recommend everyone to go out there and gain as much knowledge from as many different artists as you possibly can. Go get tattooed by, by everyone that you've ever wanted to get tattooed by, even if it takes you 20 years to save up for it. You know, the reason being is when you go and you get tattooed by that artist, or even if you just collect an original work of art from them, or you get the opportunity to go and talk to them at length, like an actual, like, invite them out to dinner, take them out to dinner if they're in town kind of thing. Um, you will learn so much by just doing that and talking their ear off and asking them all of the questions you've ever had. You know, like, how do you like your machines to run? Do you like them a little bit softer? Or do you like them to have a real nice, hard, punchy hit? You know? Boom, right there. You know, ask them that over appetizers and then start to get into different things like, well, what do you put your emphasis on, your color or your value? You know, do you, do you try to put, you know, tons and tons and tons of black in it, uh, you know, as like a base layer and then go over it with color or are you mixing black in with it as you're going? You know, little questions, little tricks like that will be a game changer for you no matter what level of tattooing you're at. And I say that in reference to tattooing just because this is a tattoo show and you guys are here to learn about tattooing. At least I assume you are, you know, based on the title of this and the channel that it's on. Cool. Well, that's done for now. I'm going to break out some, some OD green olive drabs um, and go through and start working on this shark and start blasting some color into it because why not? It's been about an hour, technically more like 45 minutes with the intro.
So let's see what we got. It's still green on it, I'm showing you. Really ain't green. Might just make it. Yeah, that'll do. Brown. 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 Thought I had another good green in here. Remember. That's a new color. I like that color. I'll, I'll mix some of that in there. Uh, and I don't think I have another sepia. Yellow. Uh, brilliant green. Nope. Uh, Viridian. Teal, teal, turquoise. Carbon black. I love carbon black. And this is a emerald raw sienna. Warm yellow. Yeah, break these two guys out. Why not? So for the greens, I'm gonna start putting in here. I've got a uh, Doc Martens Spectralite Olive Green. Don't know how well you guys can see this. Um, Spectralite is their liquid acrylic and it's the bomb.com. Um, yes, I did just say that. Yes, I know it makes me sound super old. I really don't care. You only need a few drops of this stuff. Otherwise, you're wasting it because it's super concentrated. And we're going to be thinning it out a lot. So we'll do a little bit of that. And then I've got like a little portable, small little half ounce cap bottle of um, this is FW uh, liquid acrylic or acrylic ink. And it looks like I mixed in some some raw umber these are like little tiny little soy sauce bottles um they're amazing you can get like 80 of them on amazon for like four bucks um and they come with like the little caps and everything they're awesome for like bringing your paints with you to different like places if you want to paint somewhere um you know i'll, I'll take some of these with me overseas you know, if I'm if I want to go and work at a show and I don't have too many people lined up, I'll bring these with me and that will allow me to go through and um, do some painting if I get some downtime. And, you know, it's it's just a good way to to transport them. Uh, do I have a large flat wash brush? probably somewhere that I can't find right now. That'll do. Actually, what am I doing? There was supposed to be someone else joining us today, but I don't know if they're actually going to come in in time. They make it great. If not, that's cool too. Uh, it's not really that big of a deal. But you never know. Never know who's going to jump in. Maybe Guy Aitchison will jump in. Maybe Bob Tyrell will jump in. I'm actually pretty an anxious to go and 
uh, you know, sit down with Bob and talk to him at the Red Tree, uh, the Red Tree Gallery. Speaking of which, if anyone listening is interested in getting tattooed by me at the uh, the Red Tree event coming up, um, please send me a DM on the gram. And um, I'll take a look at your requests. I've got some stuff I'm trying to do while I'm there. And I've got all day Sunday open to do a tattoo. Uh, let me know. And, you know, maybe we'll get you in and get you tattooed. I figure I'll give it another 30 minutes or so. No one else joins in. That's totally fine. You know, hopefully someone else jumps in as it's always more exciting with uh, multiple people that jump in. Once again, I'm just wetting the area in advance to go through and help control where my paint is going to go. And if I find I have a little too much water in one area, I'm going to soak some of it up with a drier brush, a drier spot on the brush. You know, because as the brush loses water, it acts like a sponge. I don't know if this area was completely dry just yet, but whatever. It's just a demo. It gives it character. Now I'm gonna take that large flat wash Pentel brush and I'm actually going to go through and switch over to a large round soft bristle. And we're going to go right along the edge of where I wet the paper previously. This is the uh, the Spectralite, by the way, the Dr. P.H. Martin's Spectralite Olive Green. You can tell it's got a very yellowish tint to it, and that is totally okay. Because I'm probably going to end up doing multiple layers. Just make sure that I have the right tone. Now this stuff does dry pretty quick, so you have to kind of be on your toes with it. But that's also why I try to wet the paper in advance because it gives you a little bit more flexibility as far as how long you can work it. And at this point in time, we're basically just moving paint around the paper. You know, spreading it out, getting a nice, nice consistent gradient. And I am an absolute obsessive compulsive disorder kind of person when it comes down to uh, smooth gradients, especially when working with watercolor. Oh, I hear that for sure. <laughs> oh, there you are. What's up, Nicole? Hi, how are you? I heard you wanted uh, people to come in and hang out. So uh, yeah. I came. <laughs> the more, the merrier. Uh, it also looks like Gerardo it was uh, looking for the uh, the link. Yeah, to... I, I, I told Gerardo to uh, to hit me up, send me a message so that I could send him the link because I can't post it publicly. That's fair. And um. 
yeah, I, I never got a message from him. So I don't know yeah. if he just wanted me to drop it in the comments, but I can't exactly do that. So yeah, that's fair. We did that before and we got like spammed with like all kinds of people just like, you know, just jumping in like, yo, how much for a tattoo? Oh God, I can only imagine. Oh, it was terrible. And it's like, I don't know how much is a bag of groceries. <laughs> how about a car? How much is a car? You know, or, or how, how long is a piece of string? That's a good question. <laughs> How long? Is, that feels like a really philosophical question, too. How long is that piece of string? Uh, I, I mean, we can get into the philosophical side <laughs> of that question if you want to. I'm down for that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Was You're talking to a guy who took several classes at a college level mm. in philosophy, world religions, and oh. all types of other ways of thinking. Oh, gosh. Yeah. My, yeah. Uh, I can talk philosophy. Oh, I that's bet. not a problem. Yeah. My uh, my husband has a, a philosophy degree and he got me with that whole like, what is the meaning of a fact? And I can't do it. Never. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to love philosoph philosophical conversations until that one. I was like, OK, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, that's it's one thing you never want to do is argue with someone that has a philosophy degree. Mm -hmm. ever just don't do it no nope. save yourself the time save yourself the headache and the migraines and yep. the day's worth of contemplating mm -hmm. do i really know what i'm talking about or no because like they will make you question the nature of your reality <laughs> i made that mistake one time with my philosophy professor back in school because I was trying to argue for a better grade on a paper. Ooh, playing the and, dangerous um, game there. And he's like, I'll be more than happy to give you a better grade, but you need to defend why you should get a better grade. And it ended up taking most of the class uh, for me to sit down and basically talk him into being like, okay, no, that, that's a pretty decent reason. You know, but he made me go through all of the steps of philo a philosophical argument, you know, identifying the, the base premise and the warrant behind the premise. Um, and they actually have, believe it or not, an equation. Philosophers have an equation that they follow for their arguments. Mm -hmm. I never knew that until I took a class on philosophy and it blew my mind, but they have it down to an exact science. Oh, that makes sense. How to sense. pick apart an argument, Right pick it mm -hmm. apart, dissect it, find the weak points, and then attack the weak points. Yeah, it's those if-then statements. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. I took an intro to philosophy or an intro to logic class one time, and it broke down into like basically mathematical equations of arguments. It was very interesting. It was like, cool, now I can, you know, prove how to tell people they're idiots on even a mathematical level. Right? <laughs> that to me is one of the most rewarding things in the world. Mm -hmm. when you can be like well guess what you're wrong and this is why and you mm -hmm. can't argue against it because if you try to argue against it you're even more wrong mm -hmm. it's definitely uh even beyond just like huge discussions it, it was really a nice eye-opener just for like your own like way of thinking too like oh okay oh, now i see like how i you know previously thought x y and z and maybe it opens up your mind to think slightly differently into maybe a healthier way of thinking or opens your mind up to like different opinions, different possibilities. So. Right. Yeah. Let me set this on gallery view. Then. One way. And it goes down. Yay. Thank you. That's better. Yay. There we go. All right. So, yeah. Uh, Gerardo, I sent the DM on Insta a while ago for the Zoom link. I have not received it.
and I don't see any requests. Weird. Huh. Sorry, Gerardo. I I have no idea, man. Are you sure you sent it to the, the right account? It should be at Philly Inc. Um, let's see. We'll do this at. I'm responding to you now. Yeah, check the comments, Gerardo. Uh, it's at Philly Inc. on Instagram. And yes, this is ink. This is uh, Doc Martens Spectralite. It's their liquid acrylic ink. Uh, it's not their radiant watercolors, which is what a lot of people think. Those, yes, they are super bright. However, coming from experience, they are not light fast, which means those colors will fade quickly. And it sucks when you have something that you spent a whole bunch of time working on and you go to look at it, you know, a few months later and you're like, wow, that is nowhere near as bright as it once was. What happened? You know, it just gets very, very disappointing after a while. But yeah, Nicole, how's life been for you? Um, it's been good. It's good. been, you know, hanging out, drawing pretty much every day as much as I can, you know. Good. Such is the life. <laughs> right. So, I mean, like, I can't, like, I can't even complain though. <laughs> so, it's kind of like it's all I wanted to do anyway. So, hey, now I have a reason to do it. Absolutely. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about working in this industry is that we really do get to have fun every day. Mm -hmm. And if it ever gets to a point in time where it's no longer fun, get out. You don't want to be one of those old crabby tattooers that's so jaded that's like, oh. yeah, sit down. We'll do whatever you want. I don't care anymore. Oh. Like, seriously, dude, just take a step back. Go find some, go work at the hardware store. Yeah. Right. Seriously, go find something else that you're passionate about and do that. Mm -hmm. Because this is not an industry for that type of person. Yeah. Unless you're one of those people that's just all about the money and doesn't really care about the ethics involved. In which case, you could you could make the argument, or one could make the argument that um you know, you don't have to be ethical. People should understand the, the kind of decision that they're making when they come in for a tattoo. That argument could be made. Hmm. Um, you know, there's several, you know, it, it all comes back to the base example of uh, getting your hands tattooed, right? Right. You know, there are a number of artists out there a, a very large portion of them that just don't care. They're like, yeah, it's a growing trend. People are over 18. They know what kind of decision they're making when they come in to ask for something like that, you know? And if they don't, well, then they're over 18. They are, you know, old enough to make these kinds of decisions. Sure. Where back in the day, back in my day, <laughs> you know, when we used to have to walk uphill both ways just to go to school. Um, you know, back in the day, no, that's not the way it worked. It's sure. We'll tattoo your hands. What are you planning on getting done for your full sleeves? Because we're not tattooing your hands until you get full sleeves. You know, that was the standard back then. Yeah. Nowadays, people only want their necks tattooed, their hands tattooed and their face tattooed as like their first tattoos. That's crazy to me. And it, I actually turned someone away the other day. Um, you know, they, they don't get me wrong. They already had a full sleeve. We started a back piece on them. Um, 
and they wanted to get something done on their face. And I told them flat out, no, sorry, I'm not doing that. Number one, you're in your early twenties. Mm -hmm. You're not set for a career yet. You're still in school. Like I'm not tattooing your face. I'm sorry. I'm that's like an area of last resort. You know, I've, I've got way more tattoos than a lot of people. And I don't have my face tattooed. I don't even have my hands done. You know, I don't have my neck done, my hands done or anything because I'm not at that point yet, but times are changing. You know, the world in which we live is changing. So is that becoming more acceptable in today's day and age? Or should we still hold on to those core beliefs and values from that time of tattooing? Sure. Let's, let's ask a judge here, uh, Gabe, let's, uh, let's have you weigh in here for us. Yeah, you know, one of the stories I tell is that uh, in the 90s when I was a young computer geek traveling around, uh, Tintin tattooed my neck without even batting an eye. And, uh, you know, there's definitely people that would give you shit for, you know, wanting to get your neck tattooed before your fucking, you know, sleeves or whatever. Uh, You know, but there were plenty of tattooers who were like, you know, you want a fucking neck tattoo? Okay, you got to wait fucking, you know, two months. Oh, shit, you're going to be here in two months? Well, okay, here we go. Okay, what do you want? A fucking, you know, he was speaking in French, but it was was 25 years ago. But, uh, you know, and again, I guess I kind of grew into the tattoo world with a different set of people too, right? Like like the, the real crunchy old timers don't give a shit about computer geeks. And, um, but that said, you know, uh, the, the reason why it is more acceptable now is because people 25 years ago were getting neck tattoos and hand tattoos. And, um, you know, it's definitely like, you know, c- certainly it's really easy to make highly visible mistakes, you know, uh, but on the other hand, I was, I was always very thankful that Tintin didn't, you know, say, no, you know, you know, I'm not going to tattoo your neck because of, you know, whatever high and mighty reasons, you know, some people think they have. I don't know. The, 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 I, clearly, you should never tattoo anything on somebody that it might be a mistake on them or, or you know. But, uh, you know, there's also the flip side, which is I've seen so many high tattooers, you know, get on a high horse and talk about ethics and morals. And just knowing who they are, I'm like, you can barely keep your fucking shit together. I can't believe you're talking to a client like this. And, uh, you know, because I've also seen really put together clients who want to get their hands tattooed have a tattooer who you know can, again can barely keep their shit together explaining to them about their life choices and whatnot and i'm like literally looking at it like you're talking to a scientist <laughs> you know you're talking to somebody who has a fucking you know uh, uh, a full career and whatnot so it, it goes both ways i guess is all i'm saying and, and ultimately like i said the, the story that i ended up uh, telling is you know I was, I was always very thankful that uh tintin you know was uh, gave me the tattoo that i was looking for and didn't give me any sort of uh, you know give me that weird attitude that's fair. And I'm wondering if that's like a really good middle ground in between a, a yes and a no is just making them wait like a predetermined amount of time to make sure that that's what they really want. Give them that extra amount of time to really think about why they're getting it. And if this is the life choice that they want to make, you know, rather yeah, than yeah. just having it be a very spontaneous decision. Yeah, sounds right. I never now, thought Gabe, about it like that. Gabe, let me ask you this. At that point in time, when you got your neck done by Tintin, was that your first tattoo? No, it was my first tattoo, but I think it was my first visible tattoo. It was definitely my first, like, real highly visible tattoo. Okay. Did you already have extensive tattoos done by that no. point in time? No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, I had some. Like, I had, like, probably, like, my leg. I had a couple on my leg, maybe, maybe one of my upper arm. Okay. But well, you I, weren't... Saying, I didn't really have any. I, I mean, I looked like I was fucking 21 years old, fucking, you know. A hippie barefoot tourist and fucking you know paris gotcha but no that's what i said like i said like for me to to hear all those stories and, and, and to watch people cop attitudes about that like i you know i was literally the, the, the plain skinner walking in wanting my neck tattoo you know i'm i'm definitely one of those people that i'm still trying to get my life together without a question ask anyone that knows me um but at, you know i'm one of those people where i'll ask do you are you set in a career you know will are questions. you yeah, yeah, yeah. you know are are you sure this is what you want to do 
I would generally ask them if they're smart. Right. So like, can I get my, you know, I want to get thug life tattooed in my neck. Are you smart? What? <laughs> well, I yeah, mean, of course I'm smart. I'll fucking know exactly what I'm doing. Oh, okay. Well, okay. well the, the question then becomes, the real what, questions. Is, <laughs> what is smart? You know, there's different ways of being smart. Oh, of course I understand that. But, you know, you can know a lot by somebody about what their answer is, right? True. Very true. That's, I mean, that's, I, I that's clearly a very I good they, observation. They, I, I, I try to, they, they put me, I, I, you know, I, I'm moderately successful in the front room. Like, I know how to do it really well. And I could, you know, uh, educate people about tattoos, you know, very well. But on the other hand, I'm prone to saying crass things that uh, should probably keep me out of the front room. <laughs> Definitely more of a uh, Wizard of Oz kind of guy. Yeah. Like a house. Uh, Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So, so you know, uh, uh, does anybody else on the line have uh, hands, face, or neck tattoos? Nah. I mean, it, clearly, there's nothing worse than seeing shitty face tattoos. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I won't ever. I was walking around when I was in college, and I won't ever forget that one of the girls I was friends with in school, um, her boyfriend had the word "pimp." in a very elaborate script tattooed from, you know, just, just towards the backside of his neck all the way around to the front of his like throat, taking up half of his neck, beautifully well executed. Um, you know, everything from very fine, like super tiny little ghost lines, um, had a very nice, crisp, clean lettering, very legible, but very, very ornate very well done i just remember looking at it and thinking to myself why why you know you're not going to want the word pimp on the side of your neck in 10 years why would you do that yeah people why? have all sorts of whacked out uh, ideas and then obviously there's the uh, you know full underworld uh, forces at work sometimes too but, uh, but I, I yeah. did want to just hop in there real quick. So like I said, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Tintin. I do have, uh, I'm just like popping in and I got a, a boogie. I've got, I, should, I should even be here today. But uh, did anybody catch that? Yeah, I didn't that expect you reference? to be on here. Yeah. Yeah, that was a yeah, great okay, reference. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> uh, well, awesome. Thanks again, Jason. We'll, uh, we'll catch up in the, in the future. Sounds good, man. Sounds good. I'll give you a buzz whenever I get done. Cool. Uh, like I said, I'm, uh, I'm, not even, I'm not even here today. So uh, the rest of today is off for me. Or not off for me, but I'm... Uh, diving right into uh, some uh, uh, deep work. But uh, yeah, like I said, I'll catch up uh, with you all in the future. Thanks again for uh, carrying on the Sundays. It's always awesome to tune in. Awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, go Tintin. Tin. Thank you. <laughs> I think if I ever got the side of my neck done, I would want a portrait of Gabe wearing headphones going, ah! <laughs> full color, full detail, like right on the side of my neck. Oh my gosh. I think that would be epic. Yeah, but see, I guess that would then, for me, like, or I guess in, in people not in the know, that that would, I feel like maybe be a tattoo that would also come into question of would, would you uh, be happy with that in 10 years? <laughs> I would, because I would know the story behind it. That's fair. And it's like, listen, if, you, if you're in the industry and you know Gabe, you know that this is like, the essence of who he is, right? Okay. He's the guy behind the scenes with a keyboard and a mouse and a couple of computers and cameras. And he is like running the back end of the tattoo technology industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's the guy that's doing that. You know, look at, um, look at a lot of the different uh, video tutorials that have been put out, like a lot of the major ones. Mm -hmm. um, that are being held in very high regard, even in today's world. You know, look at a lot of the Bob Tyrell seminars, right? Sure. Uh, Method to my madness, which is like the definitive black and gray Bob Tyrell um, how-to video, right? Gabe was the guy that created that. That's awesome. I didn't know any of that. Yep. So then, um, uh, yeah, no regrets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Gabe is that guy that's on the back end that doesn't tattoo, but knows everyone, you know, like um, Jeff Gogway and 
um, you know, Nico Hurtado and Guy Aitchison, of course, and, you know, Tintin, who's a living legend. You know, these are all guys that are very well established. Um, you know, guys that have been doing this for ages and ages that, you know, he's, he's friends with them. Um, you know, he can call them on their cell phones and, you know, shoot the shit. Uh, guys like Dana Helmuth, right? If you're into, you know, more of like a neo-traditional Japanese style, mm-hmm. actually, he's more of like a classic Japanese style. Um, based out of Virginia Beach, uh, take a look oh, at him, no. Dana Helmuth. Uh, absolutely incredible artist. I've been looking at his stuff literally for years uh, since I stumbled across him when I was in college in one of the tattoo magazines and just became obsessed. In fact, let me pull up his Insta. Yeah, please. I used to live near Virginia Beach and I'm a little upset that I, I guess, overlooked that area. Yeah, Gabe actually um, stopped by unannounced one day at my house as he was driving down to Virginia Beach. I had no idea what was going on or what was happening or who was at the door. Next thing I know, I look and it's Gabe and I'm like, (laughs) you're a real person. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you exist. (laughs) You're not just a one inch by one inch square. This is weird. (laughs) I don't know why this is uh, taking forever to load, but it is. Come on now. Yeah, there's any number of absolutely incredible tattooers anywhere you go. In fact, I even have some people that get in touch with me that are like, hey, I'm going to be traveling to this area. Like, who do you know there that's really good at tattooing? And it's like, shit, what kind of stuff do you want to get done? Um, You know, depending on what kind of stuff you want to get done and what style you find yourself leaning towards. um, You know, that's who I would recommend you going to. Yeah, let's see. Here we go. This should work a little bit better. What is soaking up all of my bandwidth? Sorry, folks. Here we go. And let's do this. No, don't want to do it. Don't want to do it. All right, fine. Let's 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 be difficult. Let's be difficult. Bring it on. 
<laughs> Challenge accepted. Yep. Better believe it. Yeah, technology and me usually get along pretty well. Uh, log in. Giving you trouble today, though? Yep. Fair. It be like that sometimes, unfortunately. I know, right? Love it when it works, hate it when it doesn't. <laughs> Here we go. So let's go to Zoom and share. Share screen. There. Oh. Yeah, he's located in uh, Virginia Beach. Not sure of his exact studio. But you can tell he's very, very traditional with a lot of the stuff that he does. Yeah. You know, like, let, let's, let's examine this for, just as a for instance. I mean, you can see, you can see the influence of people like Horiyoshi II, uh, Hokosai, um, Kuniyoshi. I mean, you can see all of these great Japanese woodblock print masters. You can see their influence in a lot of the stuff that he does. You know, like you, the samurai himself, you can, you can definitely see a lot more of the Kuniyoshi kind of influence. But the waves, I would say, are definitely more Hokusai. But he's got a very Euro-Japanese kind of style to it. Um, you know, I love his snakes and his tigers. Just always have, I mean, the scale work is impeccable. Yeah. And all the tiny little dot texture, absolutely amazing. Yeah, I like how he's varied up like the sizes of them too, to give it a, like, just that extra pop of visual interest, you know? Right. Yeah, but very, very... Um, you know, very, this is like super traditional. Yeah. I mean, all of those very large areas of pure black with just a little bit of that like lighter gray tone really, really is like iconic traditional Japanese. Oh man, looks like dude even got his nipple tattoo. Mm -hmm. I was just going to know that. Yeah, that, uh, that is a brave soul. That's a hard nope for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole bunch of nope. Uh-huh. You know, uh, so his work and um, another friend of mine named Denny Besnard. Uh, Denny Besnard also has that very um, traditional, uh, but still very European style. Yeah. Uh, Denny Besnard was the guy who gave me my first like actual real, like real, like legit uh, level 10 tat wizard tattoo. Um, yeah. I flew out to San Diego to visit some cousins. He was working at a studio right around the corner from my cousin Melissa's apartment and um, nicest guy in the world. Uh, he's French by birth, so he speaks with very heavy French accent um speaks incredible english but he weren't he learned how to tattoo at tahiti felix's uh which is one of the oldest tattoo studios on the west coast i think it's been around for like 60 or 70 years oh wow um this is actually a tattoo of a daruma that james tex did on him and his dog curled up looking like the daruma yeah so, but you can you can definitely see a very um and and I hate to to really kind of call it this, but a very euro Japanese kind of style to it. Um sure. everything from the way he draws his waves 
the amount of perspective that he uses, um, his his co- color combinations, like the the greens and the pink in this, mm-hmm. you will definitely see in a lot of very European based Japanese influenced tattoo artists, uh, especially with like the light blue around the edges. It's got that very heavy uh, European bold color style to it. I wonder that's if he really, still has. That's really amazing. Kit on. Like I like so traditional Japanese tattoos goes like way back more detailed and nuanced than I ever really realized. So it kind of leads me to ask the question of like, what do you consider is like the more traditional like colors for dragons if green and pink is more European influenced? So I mean, just looking at this, you can tell like that bold contrast. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about when I say more of like a European influence. Oh, okay. okay. You know, very, very, very bright pinks, a lot of color gradients, you know, going from this like uh, cooler green tone to like this mint um, with like maybe some browns, but accented by this very, very light blue. Mm-hmm. When you look at that in comparison to someone like... Um, uh let's see let's pull up hori uh not hori yoshi hori tomo let's find a dragon hori tomo stun and it, it'll be the perfect explanation and perfect example of the difference between the two. He's, uh, oh, come on. It's definitely been on a cat. Yeah, maybe he wasn't a little to. bit. <laughs> so he actually put out a book. Um, ah. I think. Kami, Horimitsu, no, not Lori. Lori. Uh, Horitsumi. Horimitsu's got some good stuff too. Uh, Horitsuki, Jess Yen. Well, here we go. Jess Yen. Even though Jess Yen does have a much more bold style. Um, he does stay true. Well, maybe he's not the best example of what I was talking about. Yeah, he's got a bit more of like a new school style. Oh, See all yeah, the value in that shading. One. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely not something that you see in very traditional. Um, we'll we'll go straight to the source. Horiyoshi, the great grandmaster of Japanese tattooing. Let's see if we can find a good close-up shot of um, a dragon or a flower. So this is one of his more iconic back pieces. But you see how the, the value isn't there. Right. Yeah. So where with more of a European style or much more of a bold or or a neo-traditional Japanese style, Mm -hmm. you would have, those are all of his advertisements. You would actually have a lot more value in here. You wouldn't just have uh, a gray drop shadow. You would actually have a dark red into a lighter red with a cast shadow and a skin break. Uh, you would have a lot more value and a lot more, uh, I believe the term is modeling. Um, it would look a lot more three-dimensional mm-hmm. just by using utilizing different colors. Sure. You can tell that there's not really too many accent colors or contrasting colors. You may see a lot of like flat tone pink and then black. Um and I'm not sure if this, it's just the lighting that's giving it a cooler tone or not. Because I definitely don't think he did a yellow wash over some of this. But 
but you can definitely see once again very flat reds very flat yellows um, if this was done in more of a, a European or a neo-traditional Japanese style, this would have like a, a warm brown into this very bright yellow, you know, really creating the volume and depth of each individual tiny little piece. So it would create a lot more depth and dimension by utilizing a lot of very subtle color shifts. Whereas in the more traditional way, you have a lot more flat color, uh, very consistent, standard, uniform line weights. Uh, so things generally tend to look a bit more flat as opposed yeah. to a bit more dimensional. That makes sense because they had limited needle sizes, limited colors. Precisely. Limited... Yeah, that, that makes so much more sense. Oh, there. Okay. Uh, why didn't I pull this guy up before? Um, uh Takashi. No, wrong one. Um, Akashi Tetsu. No, not Akashi. Uh, pull up Chris Garver's work. Yeah. Chris Garver. I know he's done yeah, some see, Once work. again, very, very uniform as far as he's got a lot of very delicate color shifts, you know, overall, mm -hmm. but you see a lot of very flat tones. It doesn't create a whole lot of value. It doesn't create a whole lot of depth and dimension. Um, it has a lot of the very flat, very traditional kind of, um, uh, kind of coloring to it. So it doesn't really look that 3D. It looks more like a woodblock print. Whereas if you look at other people, um, and this is kind of what I'm getting at, you know, look at some of the depth and dimension in stuff like this. Sure. Perfect example. If this was done in a very traditional way, all of these blues would just be flat blue. Yeah, The waves would have a hard outline around it. They wouldn't be very soft. This would just be done in black and gray shading. You know, these waves probably wouldn't even exist. You know, it would be very, very flat, very stark as far as um, the value and the tones go. Um, it wouldn't have anywhere near the amount of depth that something even this illustrative has. Because when you look at this, there's no hard outlines on a lot of these waves. They're very soft edge. That gives them a, a lot more of an out of focus kind of look. Whereas you have a very hard, big, bold outline around the whale itself. You know, you have a lot of very subtle line weight variations in the cats. You know, so you have a lot of very in focus and out of focus elements that creates more of a sense of depth. You have a lot of very subtle color shifts and tones. Uh, for example, right up here, it goes from like a baby blue, like used in the waves, into a very cool gray. Um, same thing over here. You have blue mixed in with the cooler gray to create some of these very subtle color shifts. You can see some cast shadows being thrown in certain areas, but all in all, it's a very, very, um, it's got a lot of great rendering in it to really force you to look at certain areas and tell you the whale with the cats climbing all around it is the focal point. Hope I explained that. You did, you did, you did a very well. good job, thank you. This is um, a perfect example of something a bit more traditional. Yeah. Once again, very flat. It does have some subtle color variants in it, but there's not too much depth and dimension. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of the subtleties and not a whole lot of the rendering that's involved in something a bit more neo-traditional or a bit more um, new school or more European uh, stylized. You know, very flat gray waves, lots and lots of very solid, just straight black shading. Um, you know, there's no like subtle color variations or anything like that. It's a color and black. 
where if we really want to look at an extreme example of uh, what's being done, uh, actually, let's look at um, King Carlos uh, tattoo. With uh, Jay Marceau. So once again, very uh, chrysanthemums are very Japanese as far as their influence. Mm -hmm. um, but this is done in almost an Art Nouveau kind of way. You know, so you see a lot of people in Europe going through and taking these standard traditional motifs and ideas and icons and then taking them and doing them in a very Europeanized way. You know, look at, for example, the drop shadow underneath this chrysanthemum petal, right? How you've got a cast shadow over here. You've got a cast shadow up here and underneath a lot of these individual chrysanthemum petals. You've got a very subtle gradient very subtle, large gradient in the background behind the whole thing to push those brighter tones forward. Um, those are all great subtleties that you probably won't see in something super traditional. So it's yeah, just, like it. just one of many different examples between, you know, the same concept just done in different parts of the world. Sure. Yeah, I also kind of like how they added all that negative space and like how they like cut it out too. It was really, really cool. Kind of adds like a whole other layer of depth to it. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It creates a whole nother, because this skin tone is automatically moving towards the foreground in your eye. So that pushes the chrysanthemum back to the middle ground. And then you've got the background with that very subtle gradient. However, mm -hmm. you see that shift as it comes towards you this all starts to even out because you no longer have the cast shadow here. You no longer have the drop shadow gradient in the background here. So as it comes towards you, it shows you that these two layers are actually merging closer together. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be very visually interesting. It is. Yeah, it definitely, it's, it's really cool because it takes a very simple topic. Well, you know, basically simple traditional topic of a chrysanthemum and then adds like huge amounts of depth to it in just very simple ways that you know it's it's really cool i like it i enjoy it for sure yeah i love and this is one of those things like if i was if i had to move anywhere else in the world i'd move to europe <laughs> i would for the i love scene? what they do I've been uh, quite a few times and I'm in love with the tattoo scene over there. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely... another great example. Yeah. Look at that. Look oh. at the vibrant color. I love the, like how he did the face too. Yep. And that's yeah. Oh. And I love like how he made the, I don't even know if that's technically drop shadow if that's just a continuation of the petals of the chrysanthemum, but he made them so blurry, didn't outline them at all to make them really almost like foggy in yep. appearance. Very out of focus, very, yeah. um, very soft in the background. Mm -hmm. Yep. These guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. Really shows depth so and dimension nice. because he really wants your eye to focus on certain spots. They're very soft, no outlines, all shading. You know, and that's what gives that that depth and dimension. Mm -hmm. I love what he did with the blade of the uh, the Reaper Scythe. Yeah. A lot of very, very long gradients in that and here, but a lot of very tightly rendered detail in the hand and in the wood shaft. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got a perfect complement there between you know, very tightly textured and rendered areas and a lot of very long, smooth gradients. Yeah, Jay Marceau is absolutely incredible. Jay Marceau. 
Yep. Yeah, look at this Hanya mask, too. This one is epic. Ooh. Looks like it's just one big piece. Yeah, he really did separate it on two different legs. That's fantastic. It is not often I, I see pieces that get broken up onto limbs like that. I know, right? Yeah, there's um, there's another guy that I'm really obsessed with his work. Uh, and let me see if I can find a picture of what he has done. Uh, ah, so if you like stuff like that, where you really start to lose the form mm -hmm. and it's separated between different spots. Definitely. Yeah. This guy is incredible. Okay. Uh, where's the one back piece that I absolutely love that he did? There we go. Let's let's Whoa. just zoom in on this if we yeah, can. Yeah, please. I don't know if it'll let me, but nope. I know he's got some close-up shots of it further on down here. Oh, let's see. Maybe that one. These are uh, two full back pieces that he's done that are just insane. Yo. I can't Look even tell you which size. one I like. Yeah, I can't even say which one I like better. <laughs> I love the one on the left yeah. just because you have this very large continuous image mm -hmm. of this like thorny rope creating movement for your eye. For sure. And it's continuing all over the back, mm -hmm. right? But it's really drawing your eye in a very specific motion. Yeah. And then and in the background, you have all of these super subtle little things You've got this reaper in the background that's just mon monstrously huge. Mm -hmm. um, and just like but, the subtle yellow tones to kind of like connect everything together to make exactly. it continuously looking everywhere. Yeah, it brings continuity to the whole piece. Yeah. And this guy is a master of that. Um, you know, he'll take one huge image. I'm not sure how close up this is. But it's a it's a good still. Actually, I was at the I was at this London show and I remember seeing that in person and was blown oh. away. Just the subtleties were insane. Oh, I bet. Insane. And I'm curious how much is not translated just because it's a photograph rather than seeing it in person, too. Exactly. A lot of these tattoos that you see that are absolutely epic in size, mm -hmm. most people don't understand how these tattoos actually move and flow with the body. So that as they twist, or if they move their arm and stretch their arm up, or twist their torso, the whole tattoo itself actually shifts. Yeah. So it moves with them. Mm -hmm. as they're going through and moving about in daily life sure it's it's really cool that you bring up that fact because it's like i saw a um a huge back piece on instagram just not too long ago where there was a video of this dude like almost like popping his shoulder blades out and right where his shoulder blades were were like these two giant demon horns on this huge portrait of a woman and it was just like because he could do that the horns would like then become 3d and literally pop out it was right the craziest thing yeah there's a lot of great optical uh optical illusion tattoos that are being done in this day and age that are mm -hmm. absolutely insane Mm -hmm. um oh, oh what what's what's the guy's name 
Um, hold on, I have him in one of my chats. Um, I'll pull him up, but his his optical illusions are nuts. Um, yeah. Jesse Ricks. You want to talk about a guy that really plans out 3D optical illusions? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is one of many pieces he's done utilizing perspective and value to create a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional area. Sure. Oh, I love how like at the very top too, where like the the um, I was in the alien head splitting apart. You just like continued going backward. I oof, that's so cool. I can't even like <laughs> form words. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, just looking at this still, you can see how he interplays with all of these different levels of foreground and background and middle ground, and how everything kind of takes. Yeah. shape and creates different layers across the board i cannot get over this very subtle highlight on the right on this guy's like shoulder where it's connecting his like sleeve. right here yes yep that's insane well, think about it like this right wherever you have a dark edge you can't have another dark edge next to it no you sure. have to really create that dynamic contrast between areas like here, where you can tell that there's a lot of like dark gray or black undershading mm -hmm. and dark purple over top of that, you really need to have a very bright highlight to separate that, to create that nice crisp, sharp edge. For sure. It's the attention to detail is just phenomenal in that sense. Cause it's easy enough to just like have the two different colors, you know, but then to also right. then remember the skin that you're leaving over. If you're trying to also make that 3d, it is going to catch light. Even if it's just very subtle, it's still going to have its own 3d form to it. Right. Yeah. This guy is absolutely incredible with the stuff that he does. <laughs> Oh, no, Bernie. Bernie, this is not an actual <laughs> Bernie tattoo. He photoshopped that in. But when you're but looking at such a large area, yeah. you really lose the sense that you're actually looking at someone's flesh. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with the parallel lines that he uses and parallel edges yeah. to draw your eye into this center focal point. That's insane. He also did this one, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Ooh. I've seen that in person too. And that is unbelievable. It really, the way that everything flows together and works well together, the depth and dimension, but still things like the smoke coming from the pipe. Mm -hmm. And how you just see subtleties of that curling over top of the tower, but still behind Gollum, right? And then swirling down and creating this almost Aurora Borealis kind of look. And then swirling up into the clouds and into the hair. Mm -hmm. You can see almost a, a continuation of it in a lot of different aspects. Oh, one of those. Obviously, that's a filter, but yeah, looking at the way he's breathing and the way his body is moving, and how as his chest expands, you see all of this expanding and contracting with it. You know that kind of thing just absolutely amazes me. Hopefully, this doesn't have that same filter on it. It, it gives you the sense that all of these different hexagon patterns are floating in space and moving with the body. Yeah.
That's mesmerizing. I could look at that yeah. all day. Yeah. Well, Fantastic. it's a little bit after three. Um, right. I'm probably going to be jumping off here in just a sure. minute. Nicole, thank you as always for jumping yeah. in today. Yeah, thank uh, it's you always so a pleasure to me. have you on. Hopefully, um, you know, next Sunday, if you're not doing anything, you can stop by and join us again. Yeah. I'll make sure to send you the link. Please do. Um, well, I hope you realize that, um, yeah, from now on, you're you're going to be getting like the messages from me all the time. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I will Just be patiently for them. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I'm ready for it. <laughs> all awesome. right. Well, thank, thank you so much. I'll, I'll go ahead and hop off. So thanks for having me. Well, how can people get a hold of you? Never. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, you can find me on Instagram, Dark Woodland Art. Um, I also tend to stream my drawing every once in a while um, on Twitch, Dark Woodland underscore. Come in, stop by, have fun. It's always a good time. So. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, for jumping in today. It's always a pleasure. Um, yeah. And I'll see you next Sunday. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. Take care. Bye. Everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Jason Leeser. I host this drawing group every Sunday at one. Um, feel free to join us next Sunday if you really liked it all today. Uh, Gerardo, uh, send me a message, man, uh, if you can. And maybe we'll send you the link for next time. Um, yeah, sorry you couldn't make it on today. But uh, if anyone ever has any questions or comments or ideas for shows or people you want us to take a look at and give you some opinions on or you know, people that do really great tattoos that you want to share, you know, send me a message. You can reach me on Instagram at Philly Inc. Um, I'll probably end up working on this green hammerhead for another like hour or so. And, uh, you know, hopefully I can get to the point where I get to finish it up, but who knows, but yeah, thank you very much all for joining us today and uh, take care and have a wonderful 